Zimbabwe's President Robert Mugabe makes his first public appearance as questions mount over his future. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley's chilling account of what she saw in South Sudan and a warning that America's patience is wearing thin. And does photography have the power to save Africa's vanishing wildlife? Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorrid. This is Africa 54. Robert Mugabe, the longtime president of Zimbabwe, made his first public appearance Friday since the military placed him under arrest earlier this week. Mugabe arrived at Zimbabwe Open University on the outskirts of Arari to preside over a student graduation ceremony. The Zimbabwe Defense Force released photos of Mugabe Thursday. Other photos show Mugabe meeting with South African mediators and military leaders who insist this is not a coup. The powerful War Veterans Association called the action a bloodless correction. First Lady Grace Mugabe was believed to be in line to succeed her husband before the military intervention. Mrs. Mugabe was last seen just over a week ago at a rally with her husband. Her exact whereabouts are unknown. Meanwhile, key figures in Zimbabwe's opposition are proposing a transitional government ahead of the elections which are planned for next year. Opposition leader Morgan Changirai is urging President Mugabe to resign. I know all of us are following very closely the events in Zimbabwe, and, and they are concerned to, I know each of you, they're concerned to us as well. And, we all should work together for a quick return to civilian rule in that country in accordance with their constitution. Uh, Zimbabwe has an opportunity to set itself on a new path, one that must include democratic elections and re respect for human rights. Ultimately, the people of Zimbabwe must choose their government. In our conversations today, we have an opportunity to discuss concrete ways that we could help them through this transition. Well, that's uh, U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, who was speaking to 37 African foreign ministers at a meeting here in Washington. Uh, now, that is the first high-level meeting between African officials and the Trump administration. The meeting includes uh, discussions on issues such as trade and investment, counterterrorism and good governance. Mr. Tillerson also encouraged African leaders to help uh, discourage North Korea. Uh, to uh, rather to encourage North Korea to end its missile programs, including downgrading diplomatic ties and expelling North Korean laborers. Now, for more on the latest uh, developments in Zimbabwe, I'm joined in studio by VOA's Zimbabwe service reporter, Blessing Zulu. Blessing, uh, we are, of course, on this uh, Zimbabwe drama that is unfolding. It was interesting to see Mugabe today outside there, but. Uh, from what you hear, what's really going on in Zimbabwe? What, 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 is, what, what are some of the things that are happening that we may not be uh, aware of? Uh, of course, it's true that uh, Mr. Mugabe first, uh, made his uh, first uh, public appearance uh, today at this uh, graduation uh, ceremony at the uh, Zimbabwe Open University. But uh, there are a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes to ensure uh, that he steps down. Uh, the first being that uh, the members of the ruling ZANU-PF party that are aligned to ousted uh, uh, former Vice President Emerson Mnangagwa are working with the opposition in parliament uh, to uh, impeach President Robert Mugabe. They think that they have the numbers. And also his ruling uh, ZANU-PF party, uh, there's, also for, uh, there's also a push to recall President Robert uh, Mugabe, like uh, what happened to former uh, South African President Thabo Mbeki uh, when uh, President uh, when uh, Jacob Zuma uh, took over. So they are also trying that legal route. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, is to uh, sort of uh, pour cold water on attempts by Sadak to intervene in Harare, saying whatever is happening, uh, the military takeover is unconstitutional. So they are trying to remove him by any means necessary or unnecessary. But uh, we can say safely that uh, inside Zimbabwe, there is, uh, Mugabe doesn't seem to be enjoying any support right now. It's like almost a consensus by ZANU-PF that he needs to get out. Uh, his supporters, uh, of course, because the military has uh, taken over, you know, virtually every part of the country, all the government buildings, the airport, everything. So it's very difficult to find people who are brave enough to be seen, uh, to be supporting President Robert Mugabe at this juncture. 
Uh, tell us about a massive rally that is planned for tomorrow, I, I suppose. Indeed. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the Zimbabwe National Liberation War Veterans Association, uh, these are Mr. Mugabe's uh, comrades during the Liberation War. Uh, they are saying that uh, Zimbabweans must uh, rally uh, together, whether they are from the ruling party or the opposition uh, party, uh, to show uh, that they are supporting uh, this uh, military takeover. Of course, you know, Vincent, uh, some Zimbabweans were frustrated to see Mr. Mugabe in power. Public. And, uh, you know, on social media, they were saying that, uh, oh, if uh, this house arrest has, has failed, why not try cardiac arrest? That's how frustrated they are. Yes. Uh, and um, in terms of uh, the military's plan, do you, do you get the sense that perhaps uh, they did not anticipate this kind of complexity? Uh, I think uh, initially when they started this, they thought that... Uh, you know, with this mass massive show of force, uh, Mr. Mugabe was going to step down and uh, maybe go to South Africa, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, it appears it's not happening. We, I talked to one of the uh, negotiators, that is uh, Father Fidelis Mukonori uh, of, of the Roman Catholic Church. He was saying that uh, yesterday and today uh, the negotiations are continuing uh, to see uh, how... Uh, this situation can be can be resolved, but uh, Mr. Mugabe has remained uh, stubborn. He's not going he's anywhere. He's a stubborn guy. We know <laughs> guy. Well, blessing. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank today you. The pleasure is mine. Sharing your with us. Well, blessing Zulu, uh, VOA Zimbabwe reporter. Now, there are renewed tensions on the streets of Nairobi after clashes between police and protesters turned deadly on Friday. The violence erupted as opposition leader Raila Odinga returned to the Kenyan capital following an overseas trip. Reuters news agency reports two people were killed as police tried to disperse supporters cheering Mr. Odinga's convoy. Police and protesters fought on one of the main, road, uh, main roads leading to the business district. Odinga has called for a national resistance movement to protest against the outcome of a repeat presidential election last month, which saw President Uhuru Kenyatta win a second term with 98% of the vote. Odinga boycotted the contest on Monday. The Supreme Court will rule on cases to nullify the repeat vote in what's seen as a last chance for legal scrutiny of that election. Now, fire swept through Cameroon's parliament building in Yaoundé on Thursday night, causing considerable damage. Local media reports say the fire spread across several floors of the building. Firefighters managed to put out the blaze before it reached the parliamentary chamber. Uh, there were no immediate reports of injuries. Now, the fire occurred just two days after the start of the legislative session. Wildlife photography is one of the most powerful tools con uh, that convey a message. One American photographer can attest to that. She's been to Africa many times to capture photos of endangered species. Uh, images are part of an exhibit here in Washington, D.C. area. Viewers Caroline Turner has more. Washington, D.C. area artist and photographer Carol Ledbetter recently exhibited her work at the Waverly Street Gallery in Bethesda. The show is titled An Impending Silence, Vanishing Africa Wildlife. It is a pictorial tribute to those animals struggling to survive. Ledbetter is dismayed to read story after story about the dwindling numbers of wildlife. She's captured stunning images of the survivors that face an ongoing struggle against the intrusion of mankind into their world. While the photographic images are captured in the wild, the artist's creativity focuses on the qualities of color, tone, texture, pattern, and form. The result is to capture the essence of the animal. The signature piece in the exhibit is called Don't Let Us Fade Away. It features ghost elephants in the foreground. It has the one elephant in the vast background, and I used two other pictures of elephants here and here and faded them away. My objective was to say, we are fading, we're still there. You may have to look hard, but we're here. About 100 elephants are killed for ivory in Africa every day, and they're on the World Wildlife Foundation endangered list. And I printed all of these images on uh, African papers, but that enabled me, because the papers were so coarse and had such texture, to bring that textures back into the animals so that almost you could 
feel the texture on the elephant's skin. I watched these elephants cavort in a water hole for about a half an hour, and this was in Kruger National Park. And the most fascinating thing to me was to watch the interplay of the parents and the babies. Because the babies would fall in the water, and then they would watch them struggle, and only would they come to them if the babies themselves couldn't get out. Both black and white rhinos are listed as critically endangered. This was taken in South Africa. And, uh, you know, somebody once asked me, uh, and again, it is a black rhino, not a white one, um, how, how would one know that this is a picture taken in the wild versus taken at a zoo? And I always point to this tiny little bird up here, this oxpecker, because they are only found in Africa. The lion is classified as vulnerable with the risk of extinction in the foreseeable future by the World Wildlife Foundation. Now we're gonna go into the cats, and we have here an example of both the lion and the lioness, and they were both taken in Tanzania. Again, very yellow colors. Tanzania is famous for its wonderful yellow hues. Um, this is part of the acacia tree, and she's on the hunt. You can see with her eye, she's just looking for what she's going to take home for dinner. And actually, she brings it back to the male, and he gets to eat first. This is an especially appealing picture of the king of beasts. Um, he was looking right at me. I was very, very lucky to get this shot. He just was following the Jeep we were in, and we stopped the Jeep, we turned off the motor, and he just had a staring contest with us. This beautiful leopard shot was taken in Kenya. I call this another very lucky shot, and one of the things you quickly learn when you go on a safari is it takes a lot of time and patience. Uh, we had been, I don't want to use the word stalking, but following this leopard. Uh, who was way up high in the trees for a long time. Carol Ledbetter's stated mission is to capture through the camera the beauty of the landscape and the cultures of the world, to display the essence of a scene or moment and invite the viewer to create their own interpretation of the image. Carolyn Turner, BOA News. Well, 15 years after the end of one of Africa's longest wars, Angola remains one of the most heavily mined countries in the world. The Mines Advisory Group, MAG, helps keep people safe from landmines and an exploded ordinance. This allows communities to grow more food, make better living, access health care. It also gives children the chance to walk to school in safety. Now, the Mines Advisory Group has been operating in Angola, where large parts of the country still uh, remain littered with mines. To tell us more about uh, MAG's work, I'm joined in studio by Mines Advisory Group International Chief Executive Officer Jane Carking. Welcome to Africa 54. Hello. So uh, we, we keep talking still about uh, Angola and mines, but it takes us back to the memory of actually Princess Diana. We remember walking through the landmines, or rather the, the, the fields of uh, Angola. Tell us about uh, first the significance of this 20 years later. Well, of course, as you say, many viewers will remember 20 years ago this year, Princess Diana really highlighted the issue of landmines in Angola and brought the world's attention to it. And this year, MAG, together with Prince Harry, her son, have been really working hard to raise public awareness that the problem has not gone away because I think quite a few people think this is a 1990s issue, this is something that's been dealt with, and there has been a great amount of progress. Over 40 years of war in Angola, between 10 and 20 million landmines were laid, and 89,000 people have been injured, maimed, or, or killed by these terrible devices. And now, in 2017, we are 56% of the way to clearing the problem altogether, but there's still a long way to go. And MAG and our partner organizations in Angola are really keen that we remind people of that. And uh, despite the fact that uh, hundreds of them are mm -hmm. removed every day, just share with us a little bit about how complicated it is to just remove one mine. Oh, it's, I am lost in awe at my colleagues who work on this day in, day out, because 
quite often, I mean, this, this weapon is indiscriminate, and that is the worst thing about it. It can't tell the difference between a woman walking to a well to draw water and an active combatant. And that means when you set out to clear a minefield, there can be a huge area where mine, landmines are laid, scattered across it. So you have to mark out the area that is possibly contaminated really, really carefully and then painstakingly make your way across it with a specialized mine detector. And then when you pick up where there might be a mine, then very, very gently remove it so that it is, is not, uh, it, it is no longer a problem. And I'm always struck when I visit MAG's minefield operations that at the end of the day, we detonate what we found and something that was a big problem when people got up in the morning has gone for good. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually like going to war uh, because you may, you may not come back alive. But uh, looking at how many years have passed since mm -hmm. uh, the landmines were put in, 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 on earth, under the earth, would you say that also uh, a major contributing factor for the slowness of uh, the response of the world is that most of these mines were actually uh, planted or buried in mostly rural areas where mostly the poor people live, the small farmers. Is that perhaps I'm, a reason? I'm sure that's got a lot to do with it. I mean, just to say, um, we have very strict procedures for, for where we work, and being a mag deminer is a, a very safe occupation and, and people follow the rules. But to come back to, to, to the, the, the poor people in rural areas, I'm sure that has got a lot to do with it. And in fact, in recent years, that's become an even more significant factor because, as, as you will be aware, in 2014, the economy in Angola collapsed. And, and what's happened since then is so many people have moved back from the cities to rural areas to cultivate crops to, to, to live off the land. And so minefields, which may not have been such a big problem when people were, you know, doing labor in the cities and so on, are now even more critical. And that's why we are saying, look, we really have to have the support to get on with this job. And talk about support quickly. Tell us the support has to come in also in terms of funding. Tell us about your funding appeals. It does. And I think it has to be said that in the last few years, as attention has waned, then so has funding. So MAG has launched a, a, an appeal called Walk Without Fear, which is what everybody has a right to do. And we are inviting people to contribute to that. And we are inviting governments, rich governments across the world, also to make funding available to Angola so that people can walk without fear wherever they are. Just hope they don't forget. People should never forget that the minds are still a danger to millions of people. Miss Culking, thank you very much for coming on and sharing with us uh, uh, that information. Well, uh, Jane Culking is the Mines Advisory Group or MAG International Chief Executive Officer. And we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCorry. Now coming up, well, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. says she saw in South Africa, in rather South Sudan. Stay with us. Thank you very much. My name is Carla Babb, and I work the Pentagon Beat. That access helps me to do better stories. Every day it's my responsibility to collect all of the defense news. It keeps our VOA viewers informed. I get to travel all across the globe. Anything that's defense related and how to protect and keep people safe, that's where I'll go. So it's never a dull moment at the Pentagon. My name is Carla Babb. This is my beat. The U.S. ambassador to the United Nations says the South Sudanese government is engaged in a brutal, protracted military campaign against a fragmented opposition. Nick Haley says while both sides are responsible for atrocities against civilians, the government is primarily responsible for the ethnically based killings. Uh, VOA correspondent Mariama Diallo was at the Holocaust Museum in Washington where Haley spoke and brings us this report. 
Nikki Haley says nothing prepared her for the level of suffering she saw when she recently visited South Sudanese refugee camps. Women are giving birth on dirt floors, floors that have now turned to mud by the fact that it's the rainy season. There is nothing that prepares you for the sobs of the South Sudanese women, nearly all of whom have been raped, sometimes repeatedly. She was the first senior member of the Trump administration to visit South Sudan last month. She said the United States at one point had high hopes for the country's leader, Salva Kiir, but there's now revulsion with what he's allowed to happen the past few years. She added there are limits to U.S. patience and generosity. His government and his soldiers have caused the suffering of millions of South Sudanese people. To his credit, he didn't try and deny it. But acknowledgement of evil is not enough. We have to take a side. She welcomed Kier's order this week, requiring free and unhindered access for humanitarian groups in South Sudan. Her remarks were followed by a panel discussion with journalists and activists, some who have recently returned from South Sudan. We're blaming most of the atrocities right now on the government, which is what is happening in this latter part of the conflict. Um, the rebels also committed really bad atrocities in, in the beginning, and just because these are the dynamics right now don't mean that the rebels are really better. Challenges One activist argued in favor of, of establishing an evidence collection mechanism. Memories fade. In such a, you know, in topography like South Sudan, evidence gets lost. It can be destroyed when people realize that one day they will be held to account. So it's very critical that today we collect that evidence because at the end of the day, it's not, you know, how the war was fought. It is the narrative that is told after the war is over. For this freelance journalist who has also done work for VOA, the question that needs to be asked to Ambassador Haley and others should be... Okay, you've talked tough. Uh, what will you do? Um, what will you do to, to actually end this war and actually bring accountability? As part of this focus on the conflict and in collaboration with Photo Week DC, the journalist's work is being projected on the exterior walls of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Maria Madialou, VOA News, Washington. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, we'll give you a look inside the hotel of the future. We'll be right back. In Zimbabwe, longtime President Robert Mugabe made his first public appearance Friday since the military placed him under house arrest earlier this week, who was presiding over a student graduation ceremony. In Kenya, two people are dead after police fired tear gas to disperse opposition protesters cheering the convoy carrying leader Raila Odinga from the airport to central Nairobi. In Togo, activists continue their protest calling for the government to implement an agreed-upon presidential term limit under which a current president would step down next year. Finally, in Cameroon, fire sweeps through part of the National Assembly building complex in the capital, Yaoundé, destroying at least four floors. Welcome back to Africa 54, and is this the hotel of the future? It's impossible for a reception staff to overcome every language barrier, but perhaps technology has a solution. A voice recognition and translation portal, for example, a Spanish-speaking person can talk to an English-speaking receptionist by simply pressing the button representing their flag and using the tablet microphone. Languages include Afrikaans, Yoruba, and Zulu. Meanwhile, Marriott has an app that provides real-time data to hotel residents about their energy and water consumption. The hotel is then able to reward guests with small incentives for an eco-friendly stay. 
Next up, uh, South Africa's craft beer craze has lagged behind countries like the United States, Britain and Germany and lacks the recognition of its wine exports. But for the first time, the industry has established a foothold at home and is preparing to conquer the international market. There are now around 200 craft breweries in the country. The local craft ale uh, industry remains small, but sales have gone from 1% of the market in 2013 to nearly 3% today. Well, and finally, Swiss scientists have created what they say is the first whole robotic system powered by vacuum. Each module of the system is made up of three soft pillars that are individually controlled, allowing it to move in three directions. The robot's developers were inspired by the way a muscles contract. The design allows it to change function using suction cups to pick up objects or stick to smooth surfaces to climb. At ground level, the system can move along using snake-like locomotion. And that is what is trending today. Now, we close our show today with the music of Kenyan artist, Webby, and the song is New Day. From all of us here in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. A plate is a dish that you put your food on. Have a lot on your plate. Hey, Anna, I'm having a party this weekend. You should come. I wish I could, but my weekend is really busy. I'm baking a wedding cake, writing my article, teaching two classes, and oh, my parents are visiting. Wow, you have a lot 